I'm Jim Mars, and I'm here today to talk to you about our occulted history. Now, let me quickly point out that this has nothing to do with devil of a worship or witches or vampires or zombies, not in the occult that we normally think of it. This is the term occulted used in the astronomical sense, meaning when the moon eclipses the sun, that's called an occultation. It masks or it hides the sun. So our occulted history simply means our hidden history. The Big Bang Theory, the idea that there were just energy in space and it coalesced and it kind of scrunched down and, and created tremendous pressure and then released an explosion and, and threw bits of energy and matter off into the universe and they spun out and they cooled and they created galaxies and they created suns and then planets and then uh, evolution started. Um, this is, of course, what we've all been taught in school, but even the Big Bang Theory today is being questioned. Uh, in a recent edition of Scientific America, it says quantum gaps in the Big Bang Theory. So the, it is simply a theory, and we're finding out new things all along. Um, one of the things we're finding out is, and one of the big questions that it's on a growing number of people's mind is, is there a tenth planet out there? Or as the ancient Sumerians called it, the twelfth planet. And there's really no contradiction because the ancient Sumerians counted the sun and the moon as planets within our solar system, and our scientific establishment does not. So we had at one point uh, nine planets, but actually now we've only got eight because uh, Poor old Pluto has been relegated back from a planet to simply a body, uh, kind of a moonlit or asteroid, uh, and uh, or, or even worse than that, I guess Pluto became Mickey Mouse's dog. But we're learning all kinds of things about the solar system. They have located a planet uh, outside the solar system that they think is part of our our system. And this goes back to the 80s when there were actually mainstream stories about this. Today we don't hear much except for uh, conspiracy uh, websites that talk about the, the 10th planet or this or Planet X or Nibiru or Wormwood, whatever you want to call it, but there does seem to be something out there. And it may, may very well be what is causing um, a perturbations in the orbits of some of the planets in our solar system and also could be behind the strange environmental changes that are taking place on this planet. There obviously is, is environmental change. Now, global warming, uh, that's been played up to try to push through a global uh, carbon tax. And sorry, uh, Al Gore, but it's not just driving our SUVs. The proof is in that the ice caps on Mars are diminishing, melting. Uh, ice on some of the moons of Jupiter are melting. Outer planets are becoming more luminescent, which means that uh, they're heating up. And so whatever is happening, it's solar system wide. It's not just our planet. And uh, it could be evidence that there is another body uh, moving into our solar system. Actually, an account of the creation of our solar system can be found in texts that are thousands of years old and predate the Bible by several thousand years. And these are the uh, tablets of the Sumerian civilization. Um, actually, it's, it's ironic, but we can know more about the Sumerians than we'll ever know about the Egyptians or the Romans because they all wrote everything down on papyrus, on paper, and uh, it uh, disintegrated and uh, burned up and got lost in wars. Uh, the Sumerians uh, carved their writing into clay tablets and then baked them and they turned to stone, and there are perhaps a, a half a million of them still in existence in the basement of museums all around the world. Uh, interestingly enough, only about 20% of them have been translated, and yet when translated, we find that they give us a, a history of our own solar system. 
we now know that the Sumerians, uh, as can be seen in this steel, knew uh, the positions of the planets and their relative sizes. And yet we also know that Uranus was not known to modern man until it was discovered in 1781. Neptune was discovered in 1846 and uh, uh, Pluto not until 1930. So uh, they actually were way ahead of us in their knowledge of the heavens. According to the Sumerian tablets, uh, everything began with a huge planet called Tiamat. And Tiamat was located uh, between Mars and Jupiter. And it was a huge planet, much larger than the Earth, and was a watery planet full of water. In their cuneiform tablets, the Sumerian told us of the war in heavens, the, the clashes that took place, and as read as a metaphor, for the creation of our solar system, it tells an incredible story. It tells of a, another planet known as Nibiru, known as the planet of the crossing, and that's because Nibiru apparently has an orbit that takes it outside our solar system and cycles around every 3,600 years or approximately, and that would be, constitute one of their years and uh, it is destined to return to the vicinity of the Earth in 2060, but that means it could be nearing our solar system now, and some people believe this might be the cause of the erratic weather and, and uh, environmental changes that we see taking place on the Earth. As recently as 2012, there are astronomers who claim they have found evidence of a, another heavenly body in our solar system. So this is not just sheer theory. Uh, the only theory comes in as to what this object might be. Is it another planet? Is it a dwarf sun that's imploded? Is it a dark hole? Uh, it, you know, we, we're not sure. And of course, the government acts like there's nothing going on. But then what else is new? So according to this ancient account, uh, thousands of years ago when uh, Nibiru passed into our solar system. It passed near to the watery planet of Tiamat, and uh, one of the moons of Nibiru actually struck Tiamat and demolished about half of that world, uh, causing it to just go into bits and pieces, but it continued in the orbit of Tiamat. This is today what we know as the asteroid belt. The other half of Tiamat coalesced and was pushed into orbit past Mars, and that is what has come to be known as our Earth. And this could explain why Martian uh, rocks and Martian fossils have been found on the Earth, and why that some of the water samples have shown evidence of Martian life, because it started off as Tiamat and then ended up here. So it actually came from Tiamat and not Mars. So today we have the solar system as we know it today, which is Mercury, Mars, uh, uh, Venus, and then Mars, and then the Earth, and then the asteroid belt, and then Jupiter, Saturn, and the outer planets. Uh, this could explain many things, including the um, origin of, of uh, comets, uh, that uh, are like icy balls flying through, a, uh, through space, where do they come from? They are bits and pieces of debris from the destruction of the planet uh, Tiamat. There are other oddities and strange things going on within our solar system. Uh, there are some of the moons that are very questionable. Um, even the famous astronomer Carl Sagan, early in his career, along with some Russian scientists, uh, expressed the belief that perhaps one of the moons of Mars, Phobos, was actually an artificial satellite. And they said this because it gave evidence of being hollow, and as Carl Sagan noted, a natural satellite cannot be a hollow object. Uh, later on, he kind of backpedaled and and acted like, well, we don't really know, and he fell into more into line with conventional wisdom as he gained popularity and fame and fortune. But even today, there are those who point to uh, Phobos as being a very strange world. Uh, 
Another moon that has really fascinated me is Iapetus, one of the moons of Saturn. And uh, it, like our own moon, it's always facing Saturn. And it's in a very permanent orbit going around that ringed planet. But what's even more astounding, as you can see here, is there's a ridge uh, of mountains or hills or a wall that circles Iapetus. Every time I look at this, it reminds me of the wall on Kong Island to separate the natives from King Kong. Uh, but it, it even gets stranger because, as you can see from these pictures, it has a big, huge crater, and it's got that line right across the equator. And uh, it looks nothing less than uh, like the Death Star in, uh, in the film Star Wars. It's also known as the yin-yang planet because it has an odd uh, shadow on it that makes it look like the ancient Chinese yin and yang symbol. Uh, so there's something very strange about Iapetus. Uh, and then that brings up our own moon. Our own moon, there's a lot of strange things about our own moon and there is some evidence it may be hollow. Um, in 1969, when the Apollo 12 crew dropped the, their lander back onto the lunar surface, NASA officials announced that the moon vibrated and rang like a bell for hours. Well, that's uh, only possible if the moon is predominantly hollow. Interestingly enough, I had a conversation with one of the astronauts who had been to the moon, and I said, what do you think about the idea that the moon's hollow? And he kind of laughed and said, no, 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 the moon's not hollow. But then he went on to say that scientists believe there may be giant caverns within the moon. And of course, here was a famous astronaut. I didn't, I didn't want to get in his face, but, you know, hollow moon and giant caverns in the moon, what, what's the difference? It's, it's emptiness in there. And there's a lot of intriguing things about our moon, for the, none the least of which is uh, how to get to be there in the first place. Uh, when I was a young man in school, we were taught that the moon uh, broke away from the Earth and was part of the Earth at some point and then broke away and didn't explain how and then went into orbit around the Earth. Uh, but now since we've been to the moon and we have moon rocks and we know that their composition is entirely different from the mineral compositions of uh, found on Earth, that it came from somewhere else. Interestingly enough, today they have the big whack theory and although they make fun of the theories of of ETs here and collisions in the past and the, and the Sumerian tablets account of the creation of our solar system, they are now saying that the moon is probably the product of a collision between a planetary object and another planetary object in our solar system that created the moon. So in essence, they are beginning to go in the same direction as the Anunnaki story, the story of Nibiru, the story of the space travelers, and the story of Tiamat being struck by one of the moons of uh, Nibiru uh, millions of years ago. Um, but the key question about our own moon is, is how to get to where it is. Uh, the famous astronomer Isaac Asimov said the moon should not be where it is. And what was he talking about? He's talking about here's the earth, the moon comes from somewhere else. It passes the earth, it's caught in the gravitational field and it's pulled back. Okay, it goes past the earth again, caught in the gravitational field, comes back again. So over time it goes into orbit around the earth, so it ought to be in kind of a wobbly elliptical orbit around the earth, but it's not. It's in a near perfect circular orbit going right around the equator with one side always facing the Earth. How does this happen naturally? Well, it, actually it doesn't. But this shows the circular logic that we're in today. We know that the only way the moon could be in the position it is is if some intelligence parked it there. We know that it's just the proper distance from the Earth to completely uh, cover the circumference of the sun when there's an eclipse. So it has to be in just a certain position. We also know that it's in this orbit that's circular and it's stationary. And the only way that could happen is if some intelligence parked it that way. Well, our circular thinking is this. We know uh, the moon's been there all through our history, so we know that we didn't park it in place. We also know there's no such things as aliens. And so we just won't talk about this. And that's where science is today on the moon. But there's other aspects of the moon that are just as puzzling. Here's a NASA photograph of what is known as the shard. This is something that's a mile high reaching up from the surface of the moon. 
Uh, we don't know exactly what it is. Is it a radio an antenna, some kind of tower? We don't know. But in the blow-up box, you can see, don't worry about the little X thing. That is simply a registration mark uh, on the photograph. But the object uh, is very strange and uh, is, has never been explained. Uh, also, in these NASA photographs, we see cylindrical-shaped objects passing in front of the moon, moving along along the moon, and, the, and in the lower right-hand corner, uh, uh, such an object as seems to be jutting out from the sides of a crater. Um, this is one of my favorite photographs. It shows what appears to be like a round rock rolling uh, down from the side of a crater and leaving tracks uh, on the moon. Um, and this, this is, of course, a slide taken from a picture that was published, so it's not a very clear picture, but in the uh, original, you can actually see these tracks move up the side of the crater and then down the side, which kind of destroys the idea that it was just some kind of round rock rolling down the side of the crater by accident. And if you'll look up to the uh, upper part, you see another, some other tracks leading out in the moon. Now this, along with lights seen on the moon, moving lights on the moon, uh, winds of water and gas passing along, some evidence of wind on the moon. Um, it, we now know that the moon has a small but nevertheless present uh, magnetic field. So a lot of what we thought we knew about the moon has been proven to be not true. There's a, there's a lot of activity going on on the moon. We also know that there's other strange artifacts in our solar system. In the Sidonia region of Mars, of course, we have the infamous face on Mars, which they've tried to say, well, there's nothing there, and yet certain times of the day it appears to be a human face. We've got pyramids on Mars, and interestingly enough, they tend to mimic the pyramids in configuration, both at, in Mexico and on the Giza Plateau in Egypt, all of which then tends to say that there has been intelligent life uh, visiting in our solar system for thousands of years. Uh, but how about our own planet? And yes, the evidence becomes even more compelling. Uh, on our own planet, we have a, a small axe found embedded in rock that dates back up to a million years. We've got the Piri Reis map that was done in the 1500s by a Turkish admiral who said he got uh, the maps from earlier Greek maps, and they, in turn, based on even earlier maps, and in his maps, we can see the correct course, co coastline of Antarctica, uh, which was not known because it's been under hundreds of feet of ice for centuries. And uh, the actual coastline was not known until the uh, advent of radar when they used ground penetrating radar to determine the coastline. And yet uh, the Piri Reis maps show accurately the coastline of Antarctica. It also shows the uh, tributaries and uh, of the Amazon River, something that was not known until there were flyovers during the geophysical year of 1958. So where did he get that? Well, he got them from much earlier maps. And what's really fascinating to me is these earlier maps uh, tend to distort as you get further out in distance. Uh, the the uh, the lone the coastlines and the riverbeds tend to elongate. This is exactly what you see on um, photographs taken from high in the atmosphere because the, you get the curvature of the earth and it begins to distort the edges of uh, the landmass that you're taking a picture of. So in other words, these ancient maps that were drawn during the 1500s based on Greek maps that were based on even earlier maps show evidence of having been copied from aerial photographs. In fact, uh, if you'll study the ancient uh, cultures on the earth, every single one of them has legends and stories of gods who come from the sky, travel in flying machines, or are able to wreak destruction with a single weapon, uh, and these gods uh, transcend all of these cultures. You find these stories in Central and South America, China, Australia, Africa, uh, Egypt, everywhere. And the common denominator is flight. They all say that these people were able to fly through the air. Uh, here we see uh, evidences of, of um, saucer-shaped objects can be found historically and, and uh, 
India, Africa, Italy, various places. Um, the piece of rusty looking equipment here is the Antikythera me mechanism, which was discovered in a Greek ship uh, back in the early 1900s. Uh, they didn't know what it was, but it has since been found to be a complicated series of cogs and wheels, and it's part of an early day computer and it is geared towards analyzing the movement of the constellations. So they had some kind of very high technology in the ancient past. We also see here some of the solid gold jewelry that has been found in Colombia. And uh, the uh, conventional scientists tell us these are just little models of insects. And yet if you look, it's got a wing, it's got a tail, it's got fins. It appears like nothing less than uh, some sort of aircraft. And in fact, uh, these German researchers uh, built a model of one of these little uh, insect pieces of jewelry, and lo and behold, it could fly just fine. So they apparently were modeling this jewelry on actual flying devices that they had seen or had some experience with and were copying it down in their jewelry. Well, since we're talking about high technology in the Earth's past, that kind of brings us to the legends of Atlantis and Mu and, and other uh, lost civilizations. Now, was there an actual Atlantis and call that? We don't know for sure. Uh, but Atlantis is a good catch-all term, meaning a prehistorical, uh, highly technological civilization. Uh, and... Uh, the evidence for this has been found actually all over the world. But again, like the story of the blind men and the elephant, when they go to the zoo and they all experience a different part of the elephant, uh, the scientists today have a piece of the Atlantean myth and story and a piece of the truth, but I'm not sure anybody has the whole picture. Other evidence of strange things going on in our background are the continuing reports of giant bones being found and some of them are just absolutely incredible. And the thing to understand is that there's really nothing new about giants. We've had giants all throughout history. We've got giants today as evidenced by some of these more modern people, uh, contrasting shorter people with the taller people. And of course we have the story in the Bible of David, David and Goliath. And Goliath wasn't just one uh, anomaly. He, he had brothers and, and he was of a clan of giants. And these giants have been with us all along. But for some reason, um, the uh, powers that be have decided to try to keep this heritage from us. Uh, the Smithsonian Institute, which we all know is a great scientific institution, uh, but what we don't know is that it is an uh, agency of the United States government. It's the government. When these giant skeletons, when giant uh, skulls, when crystal skulls, when, when very anomalous objects have been found, uh, it's the government that comes along, usually in the form of the Smithsonian, to grab everything up and lock it away. Very reminiscent of the Indiana Jones movie where they have the Ark of the Covenant stored away in a government warehouse. Um, I'm particularly interested in a story from 1909 that um, some um, employees of the Smithsonian discovered Egyptian artifacts in the north end of the Grand Canyon. And there were newspaper accounts at that time with lots of detail about the rooms that were found, the artifacts that were found, uh, the fact that they were bringing in people, they were building derricks and lowering this stuff out of the cave system. And yet today, when you ask the Smithsonian, they say, we don't know anything about that. And uh, the people in the area, and they, everybody's forgotten about it. But what intrigues me is that although they deny that there's anything to these stories of Egyptian artifacts being found in the Grand Canyon, which of course would throw the conventional history of mankind into a cocked hat, uh, we find that in the north end of the Grand Canyon around uh, 94 Mile Creek and Trinity Creek, they've got rock formations with names like the Tower of Set, the Tower of Ra, Horus Temple, Osiris Temple, Isis Temple. Where did these names come from if they didn't find something to tie it to ancient Egypt there? So again, more of our history that's being kept from us. A few years ago when I visited in Egypt and went to Seti's palace at Abydos, 
and I was looking around through this ancient Egyptian palace, and one of the guards said, would you like to see the Osirian? And I said, what's that? And I was led out back, and down under the ground is uh, these monolithic stones that have been placed together there along with an aqueduct, along with some walls and buildings. There was a uh, city's temple was built on top of an even older structure. And this structure uh, looks uh, somewhat like Stonehenge, but it is not rough stone, but very finely cut uh, granite, uh, so much so that you can't even put a piece of paper between these blocks. And it's basically hidden from view. Uh, we had to pull some boards loose to uh, get on a ladder to climb down into this sari and look around, and I was told that it was usually underwater. So the usual guests to Abydos do not get to see the Osirian, but I happened to be there during an exceptionally dry period, and we were able to actually go down and look around in there. Interestingly enough, every other structure in Egypt is filled with hieroglyphics, but not the Osirian. This is very, very strong evidence that there was a pre-Egyptian, uh, highly developed civilization that we don't know about. There is definitely uh, a power uh, going on in some of these ancient Egyptian tombs and palaces. Uh, this is a Sekhmet's tomb, and there is a statue of Sekhmet in there. My wife Carol wanted to get a picture, and so she held her camera up to get a clear shot of the Sekhmet statue. And as you can see in this photograph taken from another person on our group who was standing behind her, there is energy leaping out of her camera and moving towards the Sekhmet statue. Uh, her camera went dead at this point and never worked again the rest of the trip. Uh, she uh, bemoaned the fact that Sekhmet had sucked the energy from her camera. Again, I think this tells us there is still the remnants of some uh, very exotic technology uh, still uh, to be found in Egypt. Also in Egypt was this gate uh, that was found in the Egyptian village of Nazlet el Shanan, just outside the Giza wall, and it's adorned at the top with a little small figure uh, with a big head and big dark eyes, very reminiscent of an alien gray. Um, to the right is a rock carving, which again looks nothing less than a uh, alien gray. Uh, this gate, by the way, has now been taken down, removed, and just like everything else, they try to hide away the evidence of extraterrestrial contact or uh, pre-history uh, um, civilizations. Uh, moving to the Normandy coast, we find the uh, site of Karnak, a Neolithic cathedral. There are 3,000 500 years uh, dated back uh, of these stones that cover thousands of stones upright and that cover the countryside there in Normandy. Uh, another strange uh, site is at Baalbek in Lebanon. Uh, this, of course, is where the Roman city of Heliopolis was, was built, and yet it was built over these gigantic stones that even in today's technology could probably not be moved. Um, here you can see uh, a group of people standing in front of one of the huge stones that had been quarried but had, had not yet been moved to Baalbek. Um, it is true, and, it's, and as has been argued, that there are maybe one or two cranes in the world today that might could pick up a stone like that weighing more than a thousand tons. But as to my research, there is none that could pick up a stone that heavy and move it. They could lift it, but they cannot move with it. And so the question still remains is what kind of technology did these people have way back prior to the Roman times that they were able to build this huge platform there in Lebanon? Um, Zachariah Sitchin and other, other scholars who have uh, begun to reinterpret the Sumerian tablets say that this was the site of a spaceport where extraterrestrials landed and took off. Here we have one of the um, statues on Easter Island, and we usually just see those giant heads jutting out of the ground, and they are wondrous enough. But here we can see that they've actually excavated down, and it's not just the head. There's a whole body down there, a huge statue that was queried from some distance away of where they're buried in the ground. So who actually made those, and what was that all about? 
And what kind of tools did they have to, to make these giant statues and move them to their current locations? And why is it that after digging down and realizing that there's giant statues under here, much taller than just the heads, they have filled them in? Okay, they don't want people to know that these things exist. Um, to the right here, we see the famous coral castle uh, that Ed Leedskallen, uh built in Florida back in the 1920s. Uh, he's got some stones as heavy as 30 tons that apparently he, as an old man, was able to move around on his own. And how did he do that? He would simply tell people he had discovered the the uh, secrets of the ancient Egyptians. And he was able to move things around. Recently, there's been lots of excavation done at a site in Turkey called Gobleki Tepe. Uh, Gobleki Tepe is, uh, is called the uh, Turkish Stonehenge because it dates back uh, bef more than 7,000 years before Stonehenge uh, on the Salisbury Plain. And uh, nobody knows who built this but there are uh, incredible signs of uh, sophistication. Uh, here are some of the carvings that are still visible, uh, obviously very ornate. Uh, they think the place was built uh, as a place of worship, a place to study the stars. Again, we find, just like every other primitive society around the world, this fascinating, this in, in fascination and interest with the stars indicating they knew there was something important about that, perhaps because they knew this is where their, quote, gods came from. In addition to, the, uh, to these sites, we have these odd skulls that have been found all around the world. Skulls with elongated craniums, skulls with horns, skulls with reddish hair on them, some with fanged teeth, skulls with no teeth, giant skulls, pygmy skulls, crystal skulls that are perfect in measurements of the human uh, head. Um, and a lot of them with these elongated skulls, it makes one wonder where we see here at the bottom the Egyptian queen Nefertiti that uh, wore this conical type hat and uh, was that just a fashion uh, of the time, or was that to cover up a elongated skull because they were uh, part human and part something else? Researcher Lloyd Pye uh, has his star child skull, which he has been studying for years, and they have now find, found that uh, there are uh, nucleotide differences in the mitochondria DNA indicating that at least one of the star child's parents was not entirely human. So here we have more hard evidence that there was visitation by non-humans uh, in the distant past on our planet. In fact, the evidence of alien visitation is just, you know, compelling and almost overwhelming when you look at, at various uh, anomalous objects and sites around the world. You have ancient cave paintings of drawings that look like space people, look like people in spacesuits. Uh, we've got ancient coins that show flying objects. Uh, we show, uh, we have carvings uh, the, and, and art during the Middle Ages showing uh, odd looking saucer shaped objects flying through the air. So it's been here all along. Um, of course, uh, the idea that uh, mankind was nurtured along by some extraterrestrial force is nothing new. We saw this in the famous movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, but it's detailed more than once in the ancient Sumerian tablets, um, which when they all start off saying, how do we get here, what's going on, they tell the same basic story. 432,000 years ago, uh, before the Great Flood, that would be Noah's flood. They say the Anunnaki, which is translated as those who came from the heavens, landed on the earth, came from Nibiru through the Great Bracelet, which has been interpreted to be the asteroid belt, and they landed on the earth in the Persian Gulf. And they began to colonize and they began to search for gold. And first they tried to get the, extract the gold from the waters of the Persian Gulf, but that was slow, tedious, and did not return very much gold. So they began to explore the land. And particularly in South Africa, they found 
uh, gold mines uh, or gold uh, strata under the ground and begin to set up mining operations. Um, back in the early 90s, one of the mining companies in South Africa tried to take account of these ancient mining operations and after, after several thousand, they just quit counting. There was that many. So this has been something, this hunt for gold, this hunt for mineral resources, has been something that goes back all the way through our history. According to the Sumerian tablets, there were problems because these people who came to this planet as astronauts were suddenly turned into gold miners. And mining under the dirt is tough, hot, back-breaking work. And so there were some strikes, there were slowdowns, demand for higher wages, demand for help. And the leadership of the Anunnaki um, were troubled as to what they were going to do about it. And some of them were calling for harsh methods and punishment for those that wouldn't dig the gold. But their science officer, Inky, said, well, now, I've been studying earth primitives at my laboratory uh, in South Africa, and I believe that we could um, tweak with the DNA of these earth primitives and make ourselves a worker race that could do all the hard labor work and free uh, us of the job. And interestingly enough, they had the same ethical arguments that we have today about gene splicing and and uh, cloning. They said it is not up to us to play God. You know, only God, only the universal creative force can actually create living beings. And this is true. So don't let anybody tell you that people are trying to argue that aliens created humans. That's not the idea. All they did was what we do with animals, uh, horses, cows, sheep, dogs and cats. They improved the breed. According to the Sumerian tablets, the science officer Enki and his uh, partner Nurharshug took the ovum of an earth female and fertilized it with the sperm of an Anunnaki male and then implanted it in virtue of fertilization into the uh, vagina of a uh, Anunnaki female uh, who carried it to term and then they performed a cesarean birth and produced a, uh, a hybrid between the two species uh, that they call the Adama, the Adam, the first earth person. And initially these were like mules. They could not reproduce, so they had to keep creating them. But after further experimentation and dabbling with the DNA, they actually perfected it to where the humans can now reproduce themselves. And this is where the trouble started. According to the Anunnaki overlord Enlil, he was perturbed by the mating sounds of the humans as they reproduced like rabbits. And um, when they realized that Nibiru was coming back and there was going to be some giant earth changes, uh, it was decided that the humans had gotten out of hand. For any of the, you who've seen the Star Trek show Tribbles, it was kind of like the humans had become the Tribbles. We were overrunning everything. So it was decided to let uh, nature take its course. And when Nibiru got closer enough to cause geophysical disasters on the Earth, the Anunnaki just left in their ships and went into orbit around the Earth while the great flood rolled over most of the land. The ancient tablets that predate the Bible by about 3,000 years detail the story of the flood with two significant differences. Um, whereas the Bible story of the flood tells how Noah was contacted by his God and told to build an ark and he took care of all living things, etc. The Sumerian version uh, has the person as Upner Pishkin and he was told by his God to build an ark and it was the same dimensions, uh, sealed the same way is passed down to the biblical account. The other difference is very intriguing to me because I often wondered how do you keep going in a boat filled with animals? Do, do the lions lie down with the gazelles? You know, what's happening there? But according to the Sumerian tablets, Pishkin was told to build an ark and that uh, it was going to be filled with the seed of every living thing. And so since we already know they had a working knowledge of DNA and uh, of uh, cloning and of genetic uh, manipulation, then all of a sudden we see instead of a boatload of animals, 
He had a boat with a closet with DNA tissues and DNA samples in it that could then be used after dry ground was found to replenish the earth, and apparently this was what was done. Ironically enough, uh, science tells us that farming began in the higher um, uh, altitudes of the Caucasus Mountain region, the exact location of Mount Ariat, where we were told the ark, both in the Sumerian account and in the Bible, came to rest. Um, so you would think that farming would begin in the very rich soil of the riverbeds and then move upwards, but instead it's the opposite. It began in the mountains and moved downward, uh, uh, support for the idea of the Sumerian account. Other evidence of, uh, of life on the earth that may have had alternative technology can be found in South Africa, where scientists and researchers have found thousands and thousands of these stone circles with no entrances, no exits, they're just circles. And uh, over there, the people will tell you, well, they're just corrals. You know, that's where we keep the animals. Or that's where they did. But these stone circles have been dated back to more than 200,000 years ago. And as I said, there's no entrances. So what good is a corral if you can't put the animals in or get them out? No, they were for something else. And what they are finding out is, is that apparently this was a, a technology to draw energy from the earth itself. In some of these circles, the scientists have been able to dig down 600 feet, and they find the mean temperature of that area would, is 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and yet, when you go inside these circles, that temperature climbs to 136 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that, so obviously, there's some energy exchange going on here. And these ancients were able to harness this, this uh, energy uh, through these circles, which look uh, amazingly uh, very much like a magnetron. So there's technology in the past going far beyond what we know about it. Of course, the Great Pyramid, there's a lot of controversy about that. The Egyptologists tell us that it was all made during the time of the Egyptian dynasties and that the slaves of the Egyptian dragged giant rocks through the desert and piled them up to make these pyramids. But uh, there seems to be some physical evidence that uh, contradicting this account. For example, on the Great Pyramid and on the Sphinx, we find very obvious vertical water erosion, which means those two structures set out under heavy rains for a long period of time. And yet the geologist will tell you that there's not been any significant rainfall on the Giza Plateau for more than 10,000 years. This means the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid were constructed and in existence more than 10,000 years ago, which predates the Egyptians by about five or 6,000 years. Uh, but it even gets stranger. Uh, in 2006, a Dr. Michael Barsom of Drexel University and some of his colleagues found that uh, instead of granite blocks or limestone, the Great Pyramid is actually built from a geopolymer concrete, which now gives us a whole new theory of how the pyramid was built. Instead of giant, dragging these giant rocks through the desert and somehow managing to pile them up into a pyramid shape, they simply built forms and then poured this concrete, which solidified, which explains the giant rocks and the facts of their, uh, their close placement. A British engineer, Christopher Dunn, has speculated that uh, according to the layout and internal uh, configuration of the Great Pyramid that it was not a tomb uh, or even a, an Egyptian artifact, but a power plant, that it was drawing energy from the earth, very similar to the stone circles in South Africa, and that may have been passing this energy along to a worldwide civilization through other pyramids. We do know that pyramids can be found all around the world. There's a, a reported one in Eastern Europe, We've got the pyramids in Mexico, in South America, pyramids uh, in Greece, pyramids in China. Most people who are aware and looking around today are aware of the crop circle phenomena, so I'm not going to go into that too far, but I would like to point out two particularly fascinating crop circles. Uh, this one appeared in, uh, near the Sherbolton uh, radio telescope, which you can see in the lower right-hand corner of the picture, in August of, of 2001. And two patterns appeared in this field. One seemed to be a human face, 
um, and it's unclear on whether that's supposed to represent a human or whoever was sending this message. The other uh, is a similar diagram as to the, this diagram on the right, which was a bi in binary code, was sent into space. Uh, and basically what it says is it shows that uh, it gives the uh, DNA makeup of a human. It's got a little human shape to show two arms, two legs, small head. The orange uh, thing here is a diagram of our solar system showing with the third planet raised, meaning that we live on the third planet. And then um, when in 2001, we get a similar type thing back but there are differences. It shows a very non-human looking figure, big head, big eyes, small body, and it shows that there's life on third, fourth, fifth, and sixth planets of their system, plus uh, change, other changes in the DNA. So was this a reply uh, from space? And then uh, the next year, almost to the day, we get this crop formation in, near Winchester, Hampshire in England, um, and it clearly sh shows what appears to be an alien face with a binary code that reads, beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. We think it says, believe there is good out there. We oppose deception, conduit closing. Now, if these are hoaxes, they're very elaborate hoaxes and have been performed and been carried out by some sort of technology not generally known. And if it's messages from uh, non-humans in space, then there ought to be more attention paid to it. So all this begs the question, did our ancestors come from space? And as you can see, the evidence clearly states, apparently so, because we have reports all the way back through history. We've got in the Bible, Ezekiel and the fiery wheel. We've got the stories of flying boats by the Egyptians. We've got the flying shields of the Romans. We've got the uh, reports of things flying through the air in the Middle Ages. We've got reports of things flying through the air in the 1800s, long before the Wright brothers flew. Uh, so uh, obviously it seems like that there are uh, evidence, there is evidence to show that there has been vegetation on this planet. So that leads to the big question, you know, uh, if they were here then, where are they now? Did they all leave or did some of them stay behind? If so, then where are they and, and what do they want? Energy manipulation today is the name of the game. This is where it's, uh, this is where it's really at. Uh, if we can manipulate energy, we could have free energy, we can have anti-gravity, might even be able to manipulate time because they're finding out more and more that time and, and uh, energy and gravity are all kind of inter, interwoven. And I think we see glimpses that such technology was available in the distant past. The mainstream media has told us that uh, Saddam Hussein believed himself the uh, reincarnated Nebuchadnezzar. So it might be worth going and taking a look at King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, find out what he was up to. According to uh, the Bible, uh, he built a structure out of gold. It's been translated as the fiery furnace, but obviously it was more than just a furnace because people would go in, come out, okay? But he never got it to work quite right, plus some of his people got sick and died. So he was concerned about this. Was he creating an energy field? Apparently so. So he goes uh, down to Palestine, he gets the three Hebrew priests, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, brings them to Babylon and says, I want you to make this work. And they said, well, you're not our king and uh, you don't believe in our God and we're not gonna work for you. So he said, well, I'm gonna put you in this structure and said, you make it work or it's gonna kill you. Well, interestingly enough, they didn't just walk in or they didn't just push them in. First, they donned their raiments and their cloaks and their hats. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Or was it that they were putting on anti-radiation suits? But anyway, they put the three of them in there, and uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't want to go anywhere near it, so he says, are they in there? And one of his minions said, yes, O king. In fact, there's four of them in there. Four? He said, who's the fourth? And they said, well, it's the son of God obviously made an impression on them. Well, who was that? We don't know because there's never any more uh, reporting of what happened after that other than the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed 
with the performance of the three priests that he made put them in charge of the whole Babylon and of the whole thing. So obviously they here they had created an energy field, perhaps a wormhole, and somebody had come through one way or another. So they there's a tantalizing glimpse that they had access to this exotic technology uh, as late as Nebuchadnezzar and that Saddam Hussein might have been going for that himself. So that leads us to the war in Iraq. What was that all about? Well, we were told that Saddam Hussein was about to have a nuclear bomb and launch it at us within six weeks, but that proved to be untrue. We were told he had weapons of mass destruction, but that proved to be untrue. We were told, well, we're going to go get his oil, but that was untrue because we end up getting less than we did before we attacked Iraq. And then finally it was down to, well, we're trying to bring them freedom and democracy. Well, you might recall that when Blackwater, the mercenary private contracting team, uh, company, uh, killed about 40 people by spraying bullets in a public square, that the uh, government of Iraq, who, let's face it, was our little government, the one we had placed in charge, uh, said, hey, that's too much. We want them out of there. And the United States told them, no, I'm sorry, we have contracts with them. They have to stay. How's that for freedom and democracy? All right, so what was it all about? Well, it was about the attack on Baghdad in April of 2003. Uh, unlike normal military strategy, which is you take a objective, you attack your objective, you consolidate your winnings, pacify the countryside, move on to your next objective, we made a beeline straight for Baghdad. And what happened in Baghdad? the looting of the Iraqi National Museum. Now, what was this all about? I have the news clippings from mainstream media in my files that showed in 1999-2000, German and French archaeological teams were making amazing new discoveries in Iraq. They even think they found the uh, tomb of Gilgamesh, who up until recently was thought to be a mythical uh, character. But now they begin to realize that there, he, there really was such a person. Uh, just as now we're beginning to realize that there are stories of the Anunnaki and these people who visited from another world and could travel around by flight, that these very well have, may have been based on reality also. So where would they have been bringing the newly found discoveries uh, from the ancient Sumerian cities of Uruk and Ur? They would have brought it to the Iraqi National Museum. More than 700 thousand pieces were taken from the museum by a mob probably hired as cover for a operation that went in there. Uh, museum directors around the world had gotten the Pentagon to pledge that they would protect the Iraqi National Museum because it was the repository of human history. And yet, when the mob showed up, uh, U.S. servicemen were ordered to withdraw, and the mob was allowed to ransack the museum. But Colonel Matthew Bogdanos, uh, Deputy Director of the Joint Interagency Coordination Group, uh, investigated the looting of the Iraqi museum and he wrote, the basement is what we've been calling an inside job. I'll say it forever like a mantra. It is inconceivable to me the basement was breached and the items stolen without an intimate knowledge of the museum. From there about 10,000 pieces were taken. We've only recovered about 650 approximately. So in other words, this was a, the mob and the looting was cover for a operation to send operatives in there. They found glass cutters that are not commercially available in Iraq. The, some of the guards were suspiciously missing or called in sick. They, uh, whoever the thieves were, had keys to some of the exhibits and to the basement. And they passed up very expensive looking fakes and went for the, went for the stuff in the basement. This was an operation to gain what they thought may have been the ancient ET technology. So who got this ancient ET technology? Well, let's take a review of what we've just seen. Uh, first, this knowledge was passed through the mystery schools of Egypt and Greece, uh, and then, of course, was deposited and stayed in Solomon's temple. When then it was picked up by the Knights Templars, who then created the stonemasons, and then which became Freemasonry, the Rosicrucians, um, the Alchemist, and then the Illuminized Freemasons, these were the Freemasonry in Europe that had gotten infiltrated by the Bavarian Illuminati. 
Uh, they then, Illuminati Freemasons, then created the Round Tables funded by Cecil Rhodes, whose whole idea was to set up a secret society to try to regain North America for the British Empire. Uh, then the Nazis took over, got Solomon's treasure, picked up a lot of the secrets through their uh, magic psychic program. Then was, this was then passed to the U.S. Military Industrial Complex, uh, which is now at the head, uh, the p head corporate leaders and banking leaders are usually members of the secret societies like Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, which was an offshoot of the Council on Foreign Relations, and of course the Bilderbergers, which are some of the top uh, industrialists, uh, corporate leaders, media moguls, um, banking officials who meet once a year uh, and so secret, they don't even have a name. They're just called the Bilderbergers because they were uh, first discovered by the public meeting at a Bilderberg hotel in Holland. To the people who claim that there's a small group of people trying to control the world, is that just conspiracy theory or is there some facts to back that up? I would point you to a 2011 study by the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. They studied 43,000 multinational corporations, and they found out that these 43,000 corporations are actually controlled by only 1,318 companies, most of these with interlocking directorships and ownerships, and these 1,300 companies are in turn controlled by 147 firms with interlocking control, and that these 147 firms control more than 60% of global revenues. That's an incredible concentration of power. And of these 147 firms, um, actually the majority of those are controlled by about 20 major banks. So when they say the banks are running the world, uh, there is good evidence to show that this is true. And how do they do that? They do that from little-known agencies such as the Exchange Stabilization Fund. Um, it was created in 1934 at the height of the Depression, and it is a little-known office of the U.S. Treasury, which controls the New York Federal Reserve Bank, which in turn is the lead bank for the Federal Reserve System, the 12 banks of the Federal Reserve System. They also have handled the black budget for the CIA, which brings in billions of dollars unaccounted for. They also created the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which has come under criticism for trying to control and buy up the uh, third world countries. Uh, they, the Exchange Stabilization Fund is one of these little interlocking systems where the bankers control everything. And it's been involved in virtually every scandal in American history since its creation in 1934. And that includes uh, the claims of CIA drug smuggling, uh, Iran-Contra, and even the JFK assassination. Another little known control mechanism of the monetary uh, system is the Financial Stability Board. Uh, this originally was the Financial Stability Committee of the Bank for International Settlements, which was created to handle war reparations after World War I, but soon became taken over by the German Nazis and was a Nazi bank, and during the World War II, this was the bank where everybody kept their money and to stay above the fight. In 2006, President Obama signed on to the G20 agreement that agreed to let uh, the Financial Stability Committee become the Financial Stability Board, which oversees our economy. It uh, over dictates policy to the Fed, to the Security Exchange Commission, and other policy groups. And so this, uh, by the stroke of his pen, President Obama has now put our entire financial system into the hands of the international bankers as if they didn't have a large enough stake in it through the Federal Reserve System. So with the Bilderbergers and with these uh, international uh, agencies that are now controlling our economy, uh, this is where the power to control and manipulate the media and big business uh, comes in by a small handful of people. And these people can trace their heritage and their knowledge back to these ancient uh, sky gods. Uh, the Rothschild banking dynasty is acknowledged as probably one of the top uh, organizers of the financial pyramid of power in the, in the world today. And they, uh, they don't laugh at the idea of ancient astronauts. In fact, in the 20s, they named one of their children Nimrod because they claim that they are the descendants of the Sumerian uh, god king Nimrod. We also find that uh, 
uh, Sulla, the famous Roman general, founded a college in Rome dedicated to the Egyptian goddess Isis. Julius Caesar claimed to be uh, his father uh, uh, was Aeneas, the father of Romulus and Remus, uh, and said to be a hybrid between a human and a non-human, the goddess Venus, known as Hathor to the Egyptians and Asura to the Sumerians. And so again, we see the connection back through the Greeks and Egyptians and to the Sumerian deities, because it's all in the bloodlines. Uh, these people claim, think that they are, should be in charge of the world and they can tell everybody else how to live and they claim that right because they say they can trace their bloodlines back to the original gods of uh, antiquity. Every presidential election in America since and including George Washington has been won by the candidate with the most British and French royal genes. Of the 42 presidents up to Bill Clinton, 33 had been related to two people, Alfred the Great, King of England, and Charmaine, the most famous monarch of France. And so it goes. 19 of the presidents are related to England's Edward III, who has 2,000 blood connections to Prince Charles. George Bush and Barbara Bush, are of the same bloodline, the Pierce bloodline, which changed its name from Percy when it crossed the Atlantic. Percy today remains one of the most aristocratic families of Britain. I was amazed in the selection of 2000 to see that Burke's Peerage, a very prestigious uh, genealogical publication in England, predicted that George W. Bush would be president. They said they could say this with certainty because although Al Gore was also related to the British royals, the, the Windsors, the Bush family was more closely related to the Windsors, and therefore he would get the presidency. And sure enough, after they stopped the recount in Florida, which we now know was won by Al Gore, uh, the Supreme Court appointed George W. Bush as president, so Burke's period's prediction turned out to be true. So we find out that Gore and Bush, John Kerry, Dick Cheney, they're all related. They're all of the same bloodline. But I'm sure most people are going, well, at least you can say that Barack Hussein Obama is not part of that bloodline, but you'd be wrong. According to Lynn Cheney, the wife of Dick Cheney, as she researched her family's background, she found that uh, Barack Obama is an eighth cousin to Dick Cheney. Uh, she, uh, he is a descendant of Maureen Duval, a French Huguenot whose son married the granddaughter of a Richard Cheney who had arrived in Maryland in the late 1650s from England. Now I realize that, that you can put forth the argument that if you go far enough back, you know, we're all related to Methuselah or we're all related to Adam, so everybody can re be related to everybody else. But this only goes back to 1650, and the odds, what are the odds that of the same bloodline you get the Gores, the John Kerrys, the Bushes, the Barack Obamas, these are the only ones that get to run and be president of the United States. The Chicago Sun-Times reported that both Obama and Cheney are blood relations to the Bush family, so they're all related. According to the paper, George W. Bush and Obama are 10th cousins once removed. They're linked through a 17th century Massachusetts couple, Sarah Sewell and Samuel Hinckley. Hinckley is a distant relative of George Herbert Walker Bush's close friend, John Warnock Hinckley, whose son, John Warnock Hinckley Jr., uh, was the person uh, who has been uh, stated as the man who shot Ronald Reagan in 1981. Does that sound a little incestuous to you, that they're all involved and they're all related? Then that brings us to how come we don't know any of this stuff, and that's because the mass media in this country today has devolved down to about six major corporations. Um, here we see Time Warner, AOL, and Disney, and you can see all of the books, newspapers, TV shows, uh, magazines that these, these two corporations control, and then you've got Vivendi, Universal, Viacom, News Corporation, and Bertelsmann AG. Bertelsmann AG is a German company privately held by a, the, a family in Germany. Uh, during the war, uh, Bertelsmann was the largest publisher of Nazi propaganda for the German Wehrmacht, uh, for the military, and today it's the largest 
publisher in the English language. It controls most of the major publishers in the United States. This should be cause for concern, but it's not because most people don't even know about it, because they control everything we see and hear. Today, according to studies by Project Censor, uh, we find that the largest media companies are interconnected by common owners and interlocking board members. Uh, this is why that we are not getting any independent news. In fact, most of the TV networks uh, now have pooled their resources and they have one camera crew go and record something and then they each network, each station airs it as though it's their program, but it's all homogenized and it's all uh, government guaranteed. Not only that, but here just recently President Obama did away with the, uh, the policies that the, you could not use tax money to disseminate government propaganda as news. Now and now the military, the CIA, the NSA can now use your tax money to propagandize you and tell you things that they want you to hear in the way that they want you to hear it. For example, in September the 12th, 2009, an estimated two million Americans marched on Washington, upset and angry over Obamacare and over the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. But you didn't get to hear about it, did you? Because nobody reported on it. None of the major media would actually report on it. The New York Times, Washington Post had a few small stories saying several hundred thousand, but you can see this picture, they filled uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, and yet think back to when uh, the Million Man March on Washington, that got news coverage for a week or more. But two million Americans, March on Washington, it doesn't even get covered. The, folks, that is very tight control over the news media. Various world leaders have attempted to alert us that there's something going on behind the scenes and that there's a, a force, a power somewhere. Woodrow Wilson put it this way. He said, some of the biggest men in the United States are afraid of somebody. They're afraid of something. They know there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive that they better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. It's pretty strong. So who was he talking about? Well, we know that the ruling elite, the international banking elite, the royal families, they look with disdain on the public. Uh, one leader has been quoted as saying, we're just useless eaters. Uh, and a lot of this comes back to the idea that uh, there is an overpopulation pro problem. The very same thing we saw in the Sumerian tablets with the uh, ancient Anunnaki god Enlil, who says these, the human population is getting out of control. We've got to do something about this. All right, well today, Prince Philip of England has written that human population growth is probably the single most serious long-term threat to survival. If it isn't controlled voluntarily, it will be controlled involuntarily by an increase in disease, starvation, and war. And I ask you, isn't that about what we're seeing around the planet? Africa's being decimated by disease, war is cropping up all over the place, and there is starvation in third world countries. In fact, this to me is the greatest proof of conspiracy in the world today and the biggest conspiracy in the world today because we know that today there is off-the-shelf technology that could provide basic food, clothing, shelter, food, uh, and basic medical attention to every single person on this planet. And yet, while you're sitting here listening to this video, in the back of your mind, you know there are literally millions of children starving to death on this planet right now. Why is that? I don't want that. You don't want that. Well, after you get past the facile explanations, oh, politics and transportation and not enough money and blah, blah, blah. The real reason is because somewhere somebody wants it that way. If nobody wanted it that way, it wouldn't be that way. So that's the biggest conspiracy happening today. But let's take a look at Prince Philip's argument, overpopulation. Is this true? I submit to you, no. Today, the average living space in Hong Kong, 
And of course, there's very rich, very poor. But the average living space is 1,700 square feet. It's a pretty good size apartment. There's a lot bigger apartment than I ever lived in as a young man. Okay, so based on an average living space of 1,700 square feet, the entire 7 billion population of the world could live comfortably enough in the state of Texas. Nobody else in the rest of the world. So wait a minute, we don't really have an overpopulation problem, we have a population density problem. Everybody's crammed into these giant cities, which is creating more and more of a problem because of pollution, trash, uh, crime, congestion, etc. So what's the solution? Well, I say move out. Everybody spread out and go to other planets, you know, colonize other worlds. But to Prince Philip and uh, the ruling elite, as they consider themselves on this planet, they have a different viewpoint. Prince Philip also has been quoted saying, in the event that I'm reincarnated, I would like to return as a deadly virus in order to contribute something to solve overpopulation. They want to kill us. They want us dead. They want to reduce the world's population from 7 billion to maybe 500 million. And then they can live and have all the pretty countryside with just enough people around to mow the grass and cook the food and wash the clothes. Uh, is this really the future we want? And if it's not what you want, then you better start rethinking what you're doing and how you're doing it. Because these people want us dead, and they're going about it in a methodical manner. We're getting bad vaccinations. We're getting bad air quality. We're getting chemtrails. They are spraying chemicals on us from the sky, and they've even admitted it in certain circumstances. The fluoridation of the water. You realize one of the ingredients of Prozac is sodium fluoride. The Nazis found that sodium fluoride over time can build up in the brain, calcify the brain, and lead to zombification, basically. That's why they put it in the water of their concentration camps to keep the public pacified and non-resistant. And now they're putting it in, in two-thirds of the water supply of the United States. If your city or your town is putting fluoride in the water, you better start getting active or your children are gonna be uh, thoughtless. Genetically modified organisms. We have no idea what this is gonna to do to everybody, and yet they're, they're, they're expanding this use all over the place, although there are now countries on the world who are banning GMO foods. But here, they just defeated a law that would simply wanted them to uh, let you know when they are putting GMO foods in your food supply. Uh, label it. Let us know that that's what we're getting. No, they don't even have to do that now. It's incredible. So, this is no longer a political or a philosophical debate. This is self-defense. If you don't wise up and realize that there is a ruling clique in this world that wants you dead and wants you sick and wants you unthinking, then you're just going to end up uh, in an Orwellian society and wonder how you got there. It's pretty incredible because what we have here is a would-be ruling elite that seems bent on killing the goose that lays the golden eggs, and that being the earth with its plentiful bounty of food and water and, and arable land and, and uh, you know plenty of opportunity for anyone to live and be happy. But no, no, we have to face pollution and economic crisis and political crisis and wars because somebody wants it that way. And it's time that uh, we look at these possibilities that this ruling elite are totally aware of the ancient astronauts idea. They know that there's been technology in the ancient past. They know there has been uh, advanced civilizations. They don't laugh and snicker at all this. They know it's true. So I see this as leading to three possibilities. They're either trying to use modern technology to contact these ancient sky gods to gain their knowledge, to gain their power, or two, they are already in contact with these ET intelligences and are being guided or controlled by them, or three, they are the ancient sky gods, the Anunnaki, the serpent kings of legend.
since it's plain that they're trying to control the economy of the world and trying to destroy a good portion of the human race through disease, warfare, starvation, first we have to ask ourselves, are they just greedy corporatists? Do they not realize what they're doing? Are they simply inept and stupid? Are they merely corrupt malfeasance? Or is it time that we ask in all seriousness, are they even us? And as wild as that sounds, for our own self-protection, I think it's time that we start seriously considering that alternative.